Greetings. Last week, the Sakari Group held a live class which devoted its first portion to responding to Vocab Malone's recent show on the identity of Abba Bivens, the founder of One West. Uh, I myself had participated in Vocab's discussion, and this is a subject I like to explore, so I watched that opening portion of Sakari's class with interest. Uh, I have to say that, honestly, Al-Azhar, the leader of the Sakari Group, put forth a very good argument regarding the identity of Abba Bivens. In this video, I'm going to be respectfully disagreeing with his conclusions, but despite that, I can still acknowledge that if the discussion were to stop with that class, I would not hold it against anyone who might find the case he made quite persuasive. Uh, up to the point of his video, I would say his case is very persuasive. For that reason, when I saw that opening portion, I immediately left a, left a comment on his video uh, thanking him for his presentation, and th that was sincere. I've said before in a couple of different places in a couple of previous videos, including the show that Vocab recently did, uh, that when al makes a claim about One West history, even if we ultimately do not agree with his position, we should take his assertion seriously as he makes a sincere effort to piece the history of One West together. Uh, I think his presentation last week served to bolster that impression that he's someone that should be taken seriously when he's making a claim about One West history. I mean, I, I think he deserves to be described as a serious historian of One West. In this video, I hope to bring out some more information relevant to the topic. Uh, for those who don't know, in our attempts to explore the subject of the identity of Abba Bivens, al had concluded that he was a man named Leroy Bivens, with the surname spelled B-I-V-E-N-S, while Vocab and I, on the other hand, agree with Sam Kestenbaum that Abba Bivens was actually a man named Edward Meredith Bivens, now with the surname being spelled B-I-B-B-I-N-S. Both men were born to towards the end of the 1890s, and both men died in New York in the early 1970s. There was also some disagreement between us and al on whether the man in the photograph on the right is the same person as Abba Bivens, who appears in the photograph on the left, which is the only undisputed picture of One West's founder. I would boil al presentation down to two chief arguments. First, that the photos are of two different men, and second, that Leroy Bivens is more likely than Edward Bibbins to be the One West founder in light of where each man lived at key points in time. Uh, I'm going to play several minutes of footage from al presentation, and I'll also post a link to the full class in the video description for anyone who might wish to see more than just the excerpts which appear here. So with that, let's begin with al first point. They say that Abba Bivens is, that this is Abba Bivens. Edward Meredith Bibbins, right? And I've heard, I've heard third elder say that his name might be Bibbins, B-I-B-B-I-N-S. I've heard this before, right? So um, certainly nothing far-fetched about it. Before we even do the, the timeline of this dude, let's take a look at this photograph, right? This photograph here, and I, let me try to get, uh, uh, <laughs> this, this, where, where I'm here. So this photograph here, can I zoom in? Where to zoom at? This they're saying that this photograph, I want to get the better version. Hold on real quick. So as you can see here, this this is the, the better version of the photograph without the extras. They're saying that this is this is our man, right? And right here. Now see this picture? Take a look at this. Now here's the thing, right? We know we got, we got the only picture that we know for sure is Abba Bivens is this one. Now I'm sorry, but uh I don't see the resemblance other than their skin tone. I just don't see the resemblance. At all. You see what I'm saying? This brother don't. And this is him at the baptism of REI, right? This is REI that's here. So we see him baptized in REI. Um, so, I mean, not baptism, the bar mitzvah of REI. So the bar, bar mitzvah, which, because they were still uh, at this time, you know, partaking in many, uh, Jewish customs due to the influence of the commandment keepers and other organizations that they cited uh, in vocab and video. They're following Jewish customs. You see the hat, whatever, boom, boom. 
I wanted to interrupt here really quickly to say that if any viewer is intrigued by or curious about Ariah having a bar mitzvah, I briefly covered the subject of bar mitzvahs within the One West stream in a video from last June titled, quote, One West Bar Mitzvah, end quote. Uh, and that video touches on how the practice continued on after Bivens' time and even continues to this day among at least two groups, those being the ICGJC and the House of David. Well, that said, uh, let's get back to Alazar's presentation. So Aria had to be 12 at this time, right? That's when you get your bar mitzvah at 12, 12 or 13, right? So one of the two. Um, Aria is not all that old at the death of Abba Bivens, right? So for him, mind you, we, as we can see here, this dude is total hoary head, total hoary head, right? Gray head top and gray beard, right? This guy at the baptism of um, Ari, I mean, not the Baptist, we get the bar mitzvah of Ariah, which is not drastically long before his death. Here we see him, full black beard, black hair, no salt and pepper, right? Also, if you take close, pay close attention to the way that the brother looks, just take a look at his nose, right? And take a look at this brother here nose. This brother here nose is salaki. This brother here nose is substantially wider than the nose that you see on, on this in this picture, right? So these are just a couple things that I like to point out. The eye test, these are not, these are two different people, right? These are clearly two different people that we're dealing with. So I feel like the findings are wrong, predicated upon that in and of itself. So we see this picture of the man, right? And there's another picture of him that they provided here, right? They say, this is also the man. Uh, which is Edward Meredith? <laughs> that that that's not him. That that's a different. Person. I mean, oh man! Just to me, these, oh, man. These, these brothers do not look alike. You know what I'm saying? Could this be him when he gets older? Yeah, but this ain't them. That's who that's not. Um, I think that's pretty. <laughs> I think that's pretty clear that uh, he is not. This guy, or, or, or this guy, I don't see it. Okay, while I appreciate Alazar's sentiment, I do believe that these two pictures are of the same man, and I'm going to attempt to present a case for that in a little while. Nonetheless, uh, for now, as I said, I appreciate that there are some apparent differences in the two photos, but I'd also note that if you only have two photos of a person, differences in lighting or angle or facial position or changes to the subject's body can result in different looks appearing in those photos, especially if the pictures were taken decades apart and and especially if they're of a person that you've never met before. Uh, to, in an attempt to illustrate that, permit me to give some examples to serve as analogies. Consider these two pictures of Bill Cosby. Now, most Americans are very familiar with Cosby, many having watched footage of him for decades, and thus, you know, many are, will immediately recognize that these two shots are of the same person. But his nose is somewhat different, somewhat more bulbous in one photo, that being the photo on the right. And, uh... Partly that has to do with the position of his mouth, and I'd propose that the same could be the case in the photos of uh, Bivens. If a person keeps their lips close together at one point and then smiles, that transition can result in the nose widening a bit as their mouth spreads outwards. And here are two pictures of the American actor Abe Vigoda. He appeared in the first two Godfather films as well as other popular movies and television shows, so many will recognize him. But if these were the only two images we had to go by and we were otherwise unfamiliar with the man, a case could be made that there are differences between these two pictures, particularly in the noses. And here are two pictures of Muhammad Ali. Now, uh, you can try to imagine what it would be like if these were the only two pictures you had of him. Uh, but of course, you know, everyone is going to recognize him and he's one of the most well-known athletes of all time and he's certainly the most recognizable boxer of all time. So let me instead turn to some champions who are less well-known. I was a huge fan of Wilfredo Gomez, so I include him here. Now, hardcore fans of the boxing scene in the late 70s and early 80s will remember him, but many don't know who he is, and for those unfamiliar with him, if these were the only two images you had to go by, a persuasive case could be made for these being two different men. Note in particular how different their noses look. 
not to belabor the point, but I can make a similar case with Buddy McGirt, who I was a big fan of in the 90s. Uh, again, those unfamiliar with the man might be persuaded that these are pictures of two different men, if, at least if all they had to go by were just these two photos. For one final example, consider this man. No doubt most who are interested in the subject of the One West Spectrum will immediately recognize who that is, but I again offer this thought experiment. Suppose these were the only two images we had of the man, and suppose there was a disagreement as to whether these photos were of the same man. Could not a case be made, for example, that the man in the image on the left seems to have a wider nose than the man in the image on the right? That aside, another point which Al-Azhar made was to appeal to the dramatic difference in beard color between the two photos purported to be of Bivens. And he felt that such a change would be unlikely in light of how relatively close the death of Bivens might have been to the purported bar mitzvah of Ariyah. Now, in my response to that, I'd note that it's my understanding that Ariyah is currently about 79 years old, if not 80. Uh, therefore, if the one photo of him with Bivens dates to the time of his bar mitzvah, or at least around that time, that would put the year of the photo to roughly around 1952. When taking into account both Edward Bivens and Leroy Bivens, the date of Abba Bivens' uh, death would happen sometime between 1972 and 1974. Therefore, there could be roughly 20 years between those two photos. I definitely don't think that it's absurd for a man who has dark hair and a dark beard to go totally gray or white within two decades. I've seen precisely that happen with several people I know. But to drive the point home, uh, on the screen I have photos of the leadership of GMS, which are roughly within two decades uh, of each other. While such a dramatic graying process can happen even to people with ordinary lives, you know, from genetics or from drinking hard liquor regularly, I would propose that it can be even more likely for men who spend years and years enduring the stress of our arguing contentious subjects with strangers on the street. Now, admittedly, so far all I've done is present a somewhat of a defensive case, where I merely argue that it's not implausible for these two photos to be of the same man. Let me now attempt to instead present a more positive case for these being the same man. The first thing I would note is that for most men who have beards, you can see skin around their mouths, especially under their mouth. But in these two photos, the facial hair pulls so close to the mouth that only the lips can be seen. That's a, a rather unique beard. Uh, moreover, that aside, a second point I would make is that I think the eyes and the eyebrows are very similar, even identical. In an attempt to illustrate my point about the eyes, I'll put the eyes from one photo on top of the eyes of the other photo and merely change the transparency of the top image. I think this illustrates that the eyes are so similar as to belong to the same person. And we can do the same thing with images of the full face. Now, I want to stress that I'm not using the, some program to quote-unquote morph the images into each other. Rather, I'm simply placing one on top of the other and changing its level of transparency. I think the eyes are identical, and I think the rest of the facial structure is quite similar as well. And for that reason, I think these pictures are of the same individual. Honestly, uh, I think the reason why it's so easy to line their faces up so perfectly is precisely because it, these are pictures of the same man just taken perhaps about 20 years apart or slightly more than 20 years apart. They seem like the same man to me when you look at it in this way. Now, regarding the third photo, which uh, Al-Azhar appealed to, it seems to me that if we line them up in this way that you see on your screen, they seem to capture different stages in a man's life, especially different stages in the growth and lightening of that dense beard, which holds so closely to the lips as to reveal no other part uh, of, the, of, of the mouth, uh, you know, except for the lips. Uh, whatever the case, Al-Azhar expressed a willingness to accept that the two images on the right are of Edward Meredith Bibbins. In the next segment, I will present a case, I'm going to try to present a case, for why the One West founder, who appears in the image on the left, was Edward Meredith Bibbins. So with that, let us now consider al second point regarding where the relevant men lived at relevant points in time. Personally, I think this was the stronger of al two arguments. It says, uh, when, uh, when Edward Bibbins was born July 31st, 1896, in Germantown, Pennsylvania, right? But now it says he was born in Pennsylvania. This would contradict what? The legend, because the legend says he came from where? The South. <laughs> right? Here we have, now he's born in 1896, which fits a timeline, in, in, but in Pennsylvania, not the South. Right? So here we see in 1910, he's in Philly still. Right? In 1916, in 1924. Right? 
So let's go here all the way to 1940. He's living in Pennsylvania in 1940, right? But they say on their video that in the 40s, he was attending the commandment keepers. But he still was living in Philadelphia at this time, right? So eventually, there's not really but one record when, his, when he died that he did die in New York City, Edward Meredith Bivens. He did die in New York City in 1972. Um, but he had lived in Philadelphia. Pretty much all the records of him living prior to this was in Philly, right? So that would kind of contradict the story of Abba Bivens, who was a member of the Commandment Keepers for a while and then started uh, the school of 1 West 125th Street in 1969. Right. So I just want to put that on the record. Now, let's take a look at Leroy Bivens, who I would say was would be the identity of, of Albert Bivens. So this is Leroy Bivens in 1940 when they say Albert Bivens was attending the commandment keepers. Leroy Bivens was living where? In Harlem. Where was he living in Harlem? On 139th Street, where the commandment keepers in the, in the same neighborhood as the commandment keeper. He lives there. Right. Is that more logical or somebody who lives in Philadelphia in 1940? Right. Where was this individual Leroy Bivens born in Georgia? Right. Came from the south to Harlem to join the commandment keepers. Right. In Georgia. So now we have Leroy Bivens, who's residing at 139th Street in 1940, when Edward Bivens, who they're saying is our Bivens, Edward Bivens was living in Philly at this time. Right. Moving forward. Here is. The death index, born, uh, died in 1974, right? He died in the 70s, right? Where was he living? At uh, 1,026 New York, which is a, a, a zip code, which is lower Harlem, like uh, the across 110th Street area. So still living in Harlem when he died, right? Where the school was. Now, the only New York address that exists for Edward Meredith Bivens was on the Lower East Side, right? Which is also interesting to me. I think that this is far more substantial and and um, fits the narrative a lot more. Okay, I honestly thought those were excellent points brought out by Alazar. Abba Bivens attended the Commandment Keepers in Harlem in the 1940s. Uh, Edward Bivens still lived in Philadelphia in 1940, and Leroy Bivens lived in Harlem in 1940. Uh, if all we have are these three facts, then I'd agree with Alazar that it would seem Leroy Bivens is the far more probable candidate to be Abba Bivens than is the case would be with uh, Edward Bivens. Uh, however, it's here that I would like to present more information. On your screen, you find a membership attendance log from the Commandment Keepers. For those who don't know, a number of materials from the Commandment Keepers are archived at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem, uh, which uh, Vocab visited last summer. And here we have a page from a file from that set of materials from the Commandment Keepers. As you see, I've turned it on its side so the viewer can see what it states on that file. Uh, it reads, Membership Book 1923 to 1959, and it's from the Commandment Keepers. And uh, as you can see, written at the top of the page, uh, this entry is from April of 1946, and recorded therein is the attendance of Edward Meredith Bibbins. And what is particularly interesting is the fact that it lists his address at the time as 500 West 150th Street, which is also in Harlem, just off of Amsterdam Avenue. The same page, uh, later on down uh, towards the bottom of the page, had entries for his wife, Mabel Bibbins, and his sons, Edward Jr. and William. Uh, but what's most significant here is that while, yes, in 1940, Edward Meredith Bibbins lived in Philadelphia, according to the Commandment Keeper's own logs, in 1946, he was living in Harlem. Now, admittedly, we can't stop here. As uh, Alazar himself expressed a willingness to concede that there may have been an Edward Bibbins at the Commandment Keepers. Um, could there very well have been a brother by the name of Edward Bibbins that was Bibbins, rather, that was in the Commandment Keepers? Certainly. Certainly. Um, I don't believe he's the one that broke off and started one West 125th Street. I believe Leroy Bibbins is. So in light of the fact that Alazar himself is willing to accept that there was an Edward Bibbins at the Commandment Keepers, we have to dig a little deeper than just showing that uh, such was the case. And therefore, I'd like to turn from the Commandment Keepers archive at the Schoenberg Center to the Hatsad Hadishon archive, which can also be found there in the Schoenberg uh, Center's um, 
Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books Division. For those who don't know, Hatsad Harishon was a group in the late 60s and early 70s comprised of mainstream rabbinic Jews, both Ashkenazis and African Americans who had embraced uh, rabbinic Judaism. And the group sought to dialogue with different Israelite groups in the Northeast, apparently in the hopes of bringing them more fully into the rabbinic fold. In that archive is this very interesting directory of Israelite groups in the northeastern United States, which was compiled by Hatsad Harishon. Uh, the groups that are mentioned in here uh, are interesting. There's many interesting bits of details. Uh, for example, Beth, uh, Beth Hepzibah is mentioned. I'm gonna, I intend to make a future video on them as they have some relevance to One West history. Uh, and then also there's uh, someone at 466 East 10th Street, which is inside the Jacob Reese Housing Projects. Funny enough, I used to live in Jacob Reese Housing Projects and my bedroom window could see that building. But anyway, more interesting or most relevant to this video is this entry right here. In Hatsad Harishon's directory of Israelite groups is One West, at the time called the Israeli Tanakh School, and it lists the leader as Rabbi E. Bibbins, first initial E, like as in Edward, and last name, surname, spelled B-I-B-B-I-N-S, Edward Bibbins, or excuse me, E. Bibbins, as the head of the Israeli Tanakh School at One West 125th Street, according to this directory from Hatzad Harishon, which they maintained in the late 60s and early 70s. Hatzad Harishon initiated correspondences with the groups in their directory, even sending the directory to those groups for comments, additions, or corrections. And here is the letter that Hatzad Harishon's director in the early 70s, James Benjamin, sent to One West. First, note the date. Uh, it was sent to One West in July of 1971. But second, and more relevant, note who it's addressed to. Abba Edward Bibbins, care of the Israeli Tanakh School at 1 West 125th Street. And then note how it opens, quote, Dear Abba Bibbins with two Bs. So what's significant here is that in 1971, Hatsad Harishon understood Edward Bibbins to be the leader of the Israeli Tanakh School at 1 West. And I'll briefly scroll through the letter so interested viewers can explore it. You can slow down the video or pause it at key points, or if you're having trouble reading it on your device, just uh, shoot me a comment or a message, and uh, I can share a clearer image of the letter. Uh, more interestingly, in the same archive at the Schoenberg Center, one also finds the response from One West. Note the letterhead reading Israeli Tanakh School at One West 125th Street, and note the date, also from late July of 1971. And likewise, I'll scroll through the letter so interested viewers can peruse it, whether by slowing down this video or pausing it. And again, I can also provide a fuller image. Uh, perhaps the content of the letter will be discussed in more detail in a forthcoming discussion on Vocab's channel, um, as it is interesting. Uh, there's a lot to discuss in there. For example, he paraphrases Romans, though he attributes it to the Tanakh, uh, but he paraphrases, paraphrases Romans as part of a polemic against Israelites who are law only, or Torah only. And I'd say that makes clear that he did believe in the New Testament rather than it simply uh, being used as a hook to draw people in. But for now, what I want to focus on is on the end of the letter, how it's signed. Note that at it ends, at its end, it, qu it reads, quote, Yours truly, Rabbi E. Bibbins. Note the spelling of the surname and note the letter E for that first initial. Uh, this seems to make clear that Edward Bibbins was, in fact, the leader of One West in 1971. But more importantly, note in particular his signature. Note the particular style of that signature and hold that in your mind. Here is the draft-related military registration card for Edward Meredith Bibbins from 1942. Uh, now I'm going to scroll to the bottom where we can find the signature of Edward Meredith Bibbins on this registration card. And again, note the particular style of his signature. Note the way he writes the letters. With that, we can now compare the signature at the end of One West's response to Hatsad Harishon from 1971 to the signature on that registration card from 1942. These two signatures were written 29 years apart, yet the E's are identical, and most of the surname is identical, save for slight changes to the N and the S at the end of Bibbins. I'm confident that this is the signature of the same man. So... With all that before us, let's recap with a quick summary of the points in favor of the conclusion that Edward Meredith Bibbins was Abba Bibbins. 
first, Edward Meredith Bibbins was living in Harlem and attending the commandment keepers in the mid to late 1940s. Second, Hatsad Harishon's list of Israelite groups in the Northeast from the early 70s had Edward Bibbins as the leader of the Israeli Tanakh school at One West. Third, when Hatsad Harishon wrote to One West, the letter addressed the leader as Abba Edward Bibbins. Fourth, one West's reply was signed Rabbi E. Bibbins with a signature which was nearly identical to that of a registration card for Edward Meredith Bibbins from 29 years earlier. And fifth, while this wasn't covered in this video in great detail, members of Edward Bibbins' family, such as his granddaughter, have confirmed that he was indeed the Abba Bibbins of the school at One West. Uh, she very briefly wrote to me on YouTube a decade ago and very briefly wrote to me again on social media recently. And I know other people who are in contact with members of uh, Bibbins descendants. Now, I would like to close this portion of the video by playing one last excerpt from Sakari's video in which I feel that uh, Alazar takes the right approach. Here, listen to this. I'm not saying that I have to be emphatically right. And I there's a chance I could be mistaken. I'm just presenting my findings um, to the nation. And you guys can be the judge yourselves, but I, I went in with an open mind watching what I saw with these guys, and um, I, I, I'll lean upon what I what I found. I, I respect that, and so I would uh, echo Alazar's sentiments. You know, none of us can claim to be infallible on this topic. Uh, the available evidence has been presented, and others can now explore it and come to their own conclusions. I, for one, just uh, appreciate the opportunity to explore this in public so that others can build upon it. Finally, as a bit of an epilogue, I would like to briefly explore the question of what became of Abba Bivens. A family member of his did corroborate the story, the popular legend uh, that he died as a result of injuries suffered in a fight with men who, in some sense, identified as Muslims. However, if one browses the Social Security Death Index, one will not find a reference to Edward Meredith Bibbins. The reason why this is is because he apparently legally changed his name, at least to the satisfaction of the Social Security Death Index, and he changed his name to Eber Bibbins. For an analogy from One West history, uh, note that Ma Shah's given name was Harvey Harris, but you also won't find him listed in the Social Security Death Index under that given name, that birth name, or as some call it, government name. Rather, he's listed under a name that he apparently legally changed to, which is Moshe ben Kharim, with Kharim being spelled C-H-A-R-E-E-M. As for Edward or Eber Bibbins, some of the viewers may recall stories about him being called Eber Ben Yomin or Eber Bin Yamin or something to that effect. The way he's listed in the Social Security Death Index as Eber Bibbins seems to partially corroborate those stories. Eber Bibbins was laid to rest in Mount Moriah Cemetery in Fairview, New Jersey, in that cemetery's Ethiopian Hebrew section where Rabbi Hailu Paris is also buried. Unfortunately, Bibbins' grave never received a headstone. Now, I want to be very clear that I show this merely for the historical record and also in case anyone from amongst those who feel love for Bibbins might wish to pay their respects. Now, I want to be clear that I'm certainly against dishonoring the dead, so I share this with respect and no intended disrespect. He's buried at that open space in the center, just two spots over from the grave of Esther Bibbins, who was his daughter-in-law and who married his first son, Edward Jr., and who was also the first president of Hatsad Hadishon. As was noted on page 243 of the book African Zion, Studies in Black Judaism, Esther Bibbins herself converted to Orthodox Judaism. Honestly, it's interesting that members of Abba Bibbins' family were also members of Hatsad Hadishon, the very group which had uh, initiated that correspondence with One West, which was covered earlier in this video. On page 57 of Jacob Fried's book, Judaism and Community, New Directions in Jewish Social Work, it's noted that at that time, at the time the book was written, Esther Bibbins was sending her children, which is to say Abba Bibbins' own grandchildren, to a yeshiva in the Lower East Side, then known as Downtown Talmud Torah. Now, it should be noted that Fried's book was written in 1968. 
ultimately, Bibbins' youngest son, William, later known as Chaim Bibbins, who was also a member of Hatzar Harishon, emigrated to Palestine, to the modern state currently called Israel. Uh, in the center of this photo, you see Chaim, and to the left of him is his own son, a grandson of Abba Bibbins, who currently lives in an Israeli settlement in the West Bank near the Jordan border. While some of Abba Bibbins' descendants live in the United States, many, three or four generations worth of his descendants, live in the modern state of Israel. There are lots of images of his descendants on the internet. Some of them, like those of his great-great-grandchildren, i.e. the grandchildren of his grandchildren, have them instantiating morphologies which might lead someone, Westers, to guess they didn't have a place on the tribe's chart, at least if they were trying to judge them based on their appearances alone. There's even a video online of one of his great-great-granddaughters preparing for her bat mitzvah, but it would not be appropriate to share such personal imagery here. The only reason I share this particular image, or the only reason I thought it was appropriate to show this particular photo, is because it appeared in a public article which was published in Haaretz, which I will link to in the video description. On that note, I hope others found this interesting. There is certainly much more that can be said on this, and uh, I expect to discuss this on Vocab's channel, and hopefully there will be more videos in the future. For now, I'll say that, as always, I look forward to the comments of others. God bless. You know, I have a lot of respect for Abu scholastically, and, you know, they didn't say anything negative about me in the video. They didn't drag. I'm not going to sling no mud or nothing like that. You know, it's a... Uh, it's cool, you know what I'm saying? Just, you know, they, they, you know, talked about me in a respectful manner, so I'm not going to talk about them in any kind of disrespectful manner. And um, it, 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 watching this was interesting. 